evening. My name is Karen Diniola, and I serve as an assistant dean at UConn Law School. I am also a past president of the Connecticut Bar Association and a member of the board of the Connecticut Bar Foundation. Tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session, which is part of the Constance Baker Motley Speaker Series on Racial Inequality, established by the CBA and the CBF. We look forward to tonight's conversation and continued conversations related to racial inequality. As you all know, Constance Baker Motley was a trailblazing civil rights attorney who became the nation's first African-American female to serve as a federal judge and later chief judge. Judge Motley was born in New Haven, Connecticut and maintained strong connections to Connecticut throughout her life. Today's session is titled Critical Race Theory in Practice. We have two speakers with us tonight who will guide us in this conversation, Judge Angela Robinson and Professor Jonathan Warren. It is an honor to be present tonight, in particular as we, um, many of us watched um, yesterday's opening of, of our first black Supreme Court Justice nominee, Ketanji Brown Jackson, um, who recognized and mentioned Constance Baker Motley um, as a trailblazer, as someone upon whose shoulders she stands upon. Um, this is a pivotal moment in our, in our history. It is exciting to be um, alive at this time to witness uh, this confirmation hearing, and hopefully it all goes well, and we have the first Black female justice of the United States Supreme Court. Judge, Ro Judge Motley um, certainly uh, worked towards equality, um, and as um, written in front of the United States Supreme Court, um, you know, equal justice under the law. Um, and sometimes we don't have that. And we don't have that in our school systems. We don't have that in K through 12. We don't have that always in higher education. And as we um, have witnessed the national conversation around critical race theory and its impact on um, higher education, um, we felt um, as co-chairs of the Connecticut, of the Constance Baker Motley series, that it was time to have the conversation. And tonight, again, we are joined by Judge Robinson and Professor Warren. As we go through the conversation, please use the Q&A feature of uh, Zoom. Um, those questions are anonymous to all the participants. Um, and for some of us, it's easier to um, submit a, a question in a private situation than in public. So please feel free to use the Q&A and our panelists will um, moderate those um, after their presentation. Um, and without further ado, Judge Robinson, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Thank you both. Uh, to Judge Robinson and to Professor Warren. So I want to thank you for the uh, kind invitation, Karen, and also for um, inviting us to have this dialogue um, because I think critical race theory is really something that uh, is in the news, but most people don't really know anything about it. Um, I jokingly said in an interview when I was asked about the confirmation hearings of Judge Jackson, well, they're probably going to throw some critical race theory in it. And I didn't think that was literally going to be true. But a lot of the questions today <laughs> from Senator Cruz were about critical race theory. So he was asking the judge about it. So it, it is rearing its head all over the place in all different ways. And I'm looking forward to having the discussion with you about it today. So I always start my presentations with a land acknowledgement, but I think it's particularly important to start one about critical race theory with a land acknowledgement, because without the creation of race, we wouldn't have some of these complexities we have um, with our history with native and indigenous people. And so I want to in particular acknowledge the um, Quinnipiac tribe, because my home institution, Quinnipiac University, is named after that tribe. And I also want to acknowledge that um, the Quinnipiac people were here for thousands of years, and they maintained and stewarded the land that we now benefit for our own. And so even though I acknowledge a land acknowledgement is not enough, it's definitely, it is performative in some respects, but it is definitely a start. And so I also want to say that the views and opinions that I express today are my own. 
and they're not necessarily the official opinions or representations of Quinnipiac University or Quinnipiac uh, Law School, even though the law school has retained me to teach critical race theory there, and I'm delighted to do that. I'm really, really excited today because we get to have another speaker, Dr. Wharton from Southern Connecticut State University, who's gonna add some nuance and complexity to this discussion. He too has been teaching critical race theory at different institutions for years. And so he's gonna allow me to talk with you about some of the things critical race theory is and some of the things it is not. However, this isn't going to be a point counterpoint kind of production. So we are not going to be uh, debunking myths in a um, list faction. There are certainly other people, some of you, I think, in the audience who've done that quite well. And we're going to give um, some perspective to allow us to do some myth busting. But our real primary goals are threefold. We want to provide an overview of what critical race theory is. We want to give you some examples of its application because that's really important to see how it functions in the world. And then we wanna give you a way to compare and contrast critical race theory as an approach with other theories and academic approaches. So let's start where we are. Um, about five years ago, people started talking about critical race theory and it became weaponized as what I consider to be a political um, tool to disrupt what is called loosely the progressive agenda. Um, and the way the anti-critical race movement has framed it, you would think that it is a new development that just started within the last decade and certainly in the 21st century. And you might even think that it is this um, coordinated political effort of a certain party to achieve a certain result. And so I just wanna start by saying none of that is true. Uh, critical race theory actually started in legal academia. That's important because this is a bar association full of lawyers. And so all of us went to law school and we understand that our law professors, although they taught us some really important and uh, practical skills, many of them were academics. And so they enjoyed banding about new thoughts and new ideas about how to approach the law, how to use the law. And so in this milieu, a group of um, professors of color at law school got together at a workshop in Madison, Wisconsin in 1989 to start formally what became known as critical race theory. Now, anyone who studied critical race theory knows that its roots go back beyond 1989. So even before 1989, there were people who were trying out some of the ideas that got adopted um, in critical race theory. Um, certainly Derek Bell, who is considered the Dean of Critical Race Theory, was a Harvard Law professor who was writing about race and the law decades before the formal movement was established. But it's important to understand that the actual coming together of scholars under the umbrella of critical race theory formally started in 1989 at a Madison, Wisconsin workshop. And Kimberly Crenshaw, one of the co-organizers of the workshop came up with the idea of calling this movement critical race theory to develop a coherent account of race and the law. So these were scholars who wanted to see what it was about race and what it was about the application of race under the law that seemed to be maintaining a certain system um, even after we had the civil rights movement that successfully removed uh, formal segregation, even after we had ethnic studies departments that established formal studies of race and identity. And so they drew upon um, other legal academics to try to come up with this approach. And the two legal movements um, in legal academia that were the most responsible for um, some of the foundational elements of critical race theory were the critical legal studies scholars and the radical feminist 
scholars. Now, the critical legal studies scholars were considered the original crits. And I remember when I was in law school, because I graduated in 1989, I remember that there were members of the faculty who were critical legal studies scholars. Um, Harlan Dalton was one of them. And these critical legal studies scholars, the original crits, uh, believed that law was not neutral and that law was designed and applied in order to maintain the social hierarchy, particularly the economic hierarchy. So critical legal scholars look to see the way the law helped people with money keep their money and how it helped for people in political power to keep their power. And so they examine the law through the lens of um, hierarchy. But the hierarchy was really very much economic based and political based. And within that group, there were people who were explicitly avowed Marxist and communist and socialist. Um, it was a movement that started in the radical 60s and some of them were Vietnam um, activists. And so they came together in legal academia because remember all of this is happening with the context of legal academia and started writing law review articles and having conferences. Um, the other movement that critical um, race theory founders borrowed from was radical feminists. And um, a lot of people find this quite surprising, but the second wave of feminism um, started uh, more in the 60s. And of course, we know the first wave was about the suffragist movement. So the first wave of feminism was about the right to vote. The second wave of feminism was about patriarchy. And so these legal scholars, people like Catherine McKinnon, looked at the law to see how it maintained patriarchy. And they um, articulated that the way to uh, bring equity to society was to disrupt the gender patriarchy, the gender-based patriarchy. And so these two um, movements produced scholarship that these uh, legal scholars of color were reading. And the legal scholars of color were saying, yeah, but this doesn't account for really one of the central components of our country, and that is race. And so they decided to try to take the approach of looking at the law as not neutral, the approach of looking at legal actors as having either an overt or an unconscious investment in the hierarchical structure. And they said, we want to see how the law is maintaining the racial structure that we have. And so over the last three decades, critical race theory has grown into a fairly big and robust tent that contains scholars who now are not just legal academics, they're in other disciplines. In fact, in some ways, critical race theorists are more prevalently found among education specialists, sociologists, and historians. But they, um, they don't all agree with each other. And so there are lots of vigorous debates within the tent of critical race theory. And over the decades, those debates have been intense and those debates have um, not always resulted in unanimity. Um, and, but they did, they do disclose three central tenets um, that I think all critical race theory adherents and scholars um, believe. And those three tenets are, one, race is a social construct and not a biological one. Um, two, racism is pervasive. And three, a colorblind approach will not and cannot remove racism. Now, the one that gets the most attention and the one that gets the most um, media coverage is the second one, that racism is pervasive. And I hope that when I talk a little bit more about what that term means, you will understand that critical race theory scholars are not saying that everyone in America is racist or that every white American is racist. Um, they definitely aspire to the belief that there are people who are blatantly and overtly racist. In other, there are people who in 
who consciously believe that um, certain races are superior to others. But when we're talking about critical race theory, we're, we're defining racism more broadly than individual actors. And so before we get to that, I do want to focus on the first one, which is the idea that race is social and it is man-made. And I do mean that in the gendered sense of man and that it's not biologically created. So we now know because of the human genome uh, project that every human being is 99.9% .9 genetically identical. That means that everyone who is here today is identical to everyone else with a variation of 0.1%. We also know, just so you know, that that 0.1% does not correlate to race. So the ways that we are different are not based on racial categories. So regrettably, I have to devote an entire class to this concept because this isn't something that we're necessarily taught. Um, even well-educated and well-read people don't necessarily realize that there have been hundreds of years of race science that have tried to find a way to distinguish races scientifically, and they haven't been able to do it. They've looked at, I, I saw, I used a documentary called Race, the Power of an Illusion. And one of the commentators in it said, if there was something different about the races, we would know because every part of the body has been examined to see if there's a way to determine whether a person is white, black, Asian, Latinx, um, and there's just no way to do that. So race is not a science-based phenomenon, but that does not mean that race is not real. And that's sort of the oxymoron that we have. We are acculturated in our country to understand racial classifications and to believe they have meaning and therefore they actually do have meaning. Not scientifically based meaning, and what do I mean by that? So among all of the races, talent is distributed and intelligence is distributed and all the other different characteristics and traits are distributed and they don't correlate with racial classifications. But we do know that virtually every aspect of life from wealth to income, to home ownership, to residential trends, to education, um, to health and criminal justice and leadership, we know all of those are influenced by race. So we see racial disparities in all of these ways. And that is what um, critical race theorists say, mean when they say racism is pervasive. We look at residential patterns, we can see these patterns. And these patterns distribute um, privileges and rights in a way where white consistently have better performance, better outcome, better resources than any other group, even when you control for other factors. And so the critical race theory scholars said, we have to look to see how the law is creating and maintaining these hierarchies. And it's really to under, uh, important to understand, they don't always agree on how that is, but, they said, we have to look at the law. We have to look at the context of the law and to see what is man-made and what is perpetuating all of these disparities. And so what I want you to remember, if you don't remember much anything else, is that race is not scientifically based and laws and rules that are made by man have created and perpetuate race. So from the very founding of our country, we started taking censuses every 10 years. And those censuses had racial categories. And believe it or not, since 17, since the very first census, which I think was 1790 to today, no two censuses have had the exact same racial classifications. And that's because these are made up categories. So they change from time to time based on the politics and whims of the time. Unless you think that this US census classification is an ancient problem, uh -uh, 
In 2010 and 2020, we can see that laws and rules are still creating race. So in 2010, if you were an Egyptian American, someone who is from Egypt or whose heritage is from Egypt and Egypt is in Africa, in 2010, you would have likely checked the box for um, Black, African American, or Negro. That was one line. Um, in 2020, the census was revised. And in the 2020 census, on the line that says white, it includes people who are Egyptian American. And so in 2010, you would have been Black, African American. But in 2020, you would be white, Caucasian. And that's because the creators of the 2020 census decided to define and include Libyan Americans and um, Egyptian Americans in the category of Caucasian. Um, they declined to use the the category of Middle Eastern and North African as a lot of people from that country wanted them to do. And so people from those parts are considered white. Now, if you are a uh, multiracial or if you looked at the census, you know that you can pick multiple boxes. And so if you do pick multiple boxes, you will be ascribed uh, uh, to the non-white race. So did you hear what I said? If you pick white, and that's the only box you are, you count as white. If you pick white and any other race, you're going to be ascribed to a non-white race. That's a creation of man. That's a rule that we made up. We made up based on what? Um, OK, I'm going to look at my time. And if we have time, I'll come back to this slide where we talk about um, legislation that has been race-based and perpetuates these racial disparities and court interpretations. Because I do want to get to something that I think should be kind of interesting because we're lawyers. And that's just some legal cases that I use in my classes to talk about how the law has created race, but also the legacy that that law has perpetuated. And so if you remember the case of People versus Hall, I'm not sure I learned this in law school. It was a criminal case that came out of the state of California. And it's important to understand when we talk about race law, we're talking both about state law and federal law because they had different rules and different laws. Um, in 1854, there was a law in California that said Blacks could not testify as witnesses against whites. And there was a crime allegedly committed by Hall. Hall was white. Hall was convicted. And he was convicted based on the testimony of witnesses who were Chinese. And he appealed and he said, the Chinese can't um, testify against me, I'm white. And they're equivalent to black, they're not white. And of course the law was explicit. It said blacks could not testify, but the court said, you know, when they mean blacks can't testify, they mean anyone who's not white. And so Chinese equals white. And so the law, created a race for Chinese people that equated them with um, non-white people, which at the time equated them with Black people. Um, and I am definitely running out of time, so I'm going <laughs> to skip the last trio of citizenship cases, and maybe at the end, Professor Wharton, we can go back to that. But um, the so critical race theory, um, came up with this new way of looking about at race, trying to apply the law to see how it was perpetuating racial disparities. And they realized if they wanted to do that, they needed to come up with new tools and new methods and new vocabulary. And so they adopted that uh, saying from the Audrey Lord uh, quote, that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Meaning, if we want to undo the um, racism that was created by law, we can't apply the law that was created to do that. We have to apply different principles and different ways to do that. And some of those ways were, were through storytelling and narrative. 
and counter narrative. Some of them were through what we call interest convergence and the ARC case, which was the birthright citizenship case, which said that if you're born in the United States, regardless of whether you're Chinese or not, that's a great example of interest convergence. Um, Anti-essentialism, which means that um, even though all women are women, all women are not the same, so that there's not some essential element that makes one a woman or makes one Black. And then racial schemas, the idea that um, we don't have to think about uh, racial meanings. Our brains process things so automatically that because of the way we've been raised and acculturated, we attach meaning to races without even realizing it. So critical race theory treats race as the man-made uh, system that it is, which means, and I love this quote, like citizenship, race is a political system that governs people by sorting them into social groupings based on invented biological demarcations. Race is not uh, only interpreted according to invented rules, but more important, race itself is an invented political grouping. Race is not a biological category that is politically charged. It is a political category that has been disguised as a biological one. The very step of creating race is a political practice. And so briefly, um, ra a critical race theory is not taught in primary or secondary schools. It's not the teaching of history. It's not the teaching of social studies. It's not the teaching of social study, um, of geography. Uh, Professor Wharton is gonna really explain why critical race theory can't really be taught there, but it's not even really taught in colleges. Even critics of critical race theory acknowledge that it's only taught in about 300 colleges, like only about 300 out of 4,000 colleges have a class called critical race theory. Um, it's not Marxist, socialist, pro-democratic or anti-Republican. It really is critical of progressives and conservatives. It is not aligned with any political category. It is not anti-white. Uh, political uh, critical race theory scholars want to disrupt the hierarchy. They don't want to rearrange it. So the point isn't to drag white people down to the bottom and put people of color at the top. The point is to make the racial classifications meaningless to the meaning of people's lives. Um, and then most importantly, it's not new. It's been around for three decades. And so I always joke and say, if it was going to destroy the United States, we would know it by now. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Wharton, who's going to share how he approaches teaching critical race theory and some other um, approaches. Because what I want you to know is this is just one way of looking at and examining race. It is not the only one. And uh, so with that, I turn it over to Professor Ward. Thank you, Judge Robinson. I appreciate the opportunity um, to speak today uh, along with her. Um, this certainly is, uh, I'm even learning even more details uh, with, with everything. This is always the great thing about collaborative approaches. So the first thing is that, you know, I, I teach identity politics, essentially, on uh, race, ethnicity, uh, gender, class, sexual orientation. Uh, there is actually a class that's on the books of Southern on that, but it's not explicit class that says critical race theory. We, there is no such class that, that exists per se. And when I'm teaching it, it's mostly for graduate students. Um, and as a matter of fact, as, as Judge Robinson offered, it's not unusual that you see this across in graduate school and certainly in education and in social science fields because it's oftentimes taught with other areas. So one of the other areas that, that I wanted to kind of bring up beyond just critical race theory are other approaches to understanding race and ethnic, ethnic politics. Uh, one popular offshoot of critical race theory, but really in many ways it's almost its own thing, is intersectionality. And that is the consideration of various backgrounds, that it's not just about race, it's not just about ethnicity, it's not just about religion, it's not just about gender, sexual orientation, it can be elements of other things like class, for example. So what Judge Robinson offered there in terms of Egyptian Americans is a great example of intersectionality because you know 
you add another complexity to, you know, the dynamics surrounding religion in Egypt, well, that can be a consideration to another lens. If you include certainly something along the dynamics of gender and even uh, sexual orientation as well to Egyptian uh, Americans, that could be another element to, to everything else. So it's not just through what I oftentimes stress a black and white lens. It can be oftentimes charcoal, you know, uh, you know, gray and heather, among other distinctions that, that really define some of these categories. Race consciousness has been around for a while as well. In terms of understanding, what does it mean? to be identified politically and socially to a specific community or grouping, not just in, internally, but even externally. How does, how do at least some communities verify or view or consider race and ethnicities too? And beyond that, certainly legal institutions too. So there can be a lot of dynamics that, that play in race consciousness. Coalition building politics is actually technically what I study. That's actually more my field. And what it is, is that you're trying to, since I study state and local government, you're attempting to understand how communities uh, work or not work together when it comes to maybe making changes in um, you know, racial, ethnic communities, or even in urban areas. And so I, as, in, as an urbanist, somebody who studies local politics, I'm oftentimes framing uh, political change and social concerns to uh, in variety of communities. And so that's what coalition building politics essentially is. Uh, you're trying to find pathways of working between different communities uh, whether they're Latino, Black, White, um, or even in many cases, actually there's a lot of research done on, on Jewish Americans and how they found pathways of working, especially on the West Coast, with other uh, communities as well. So there's a lot of studies on that. Interestingly enough, a lot of it tends to be more in California, <laughs> not surprisingly, because a lot of that research has been done even before critical race theory even came about. And that was mostly done in the 70s, interestingly, and even late 60s, because of a lot of the movements uh, that just took place. And then, of course, critical race theory, which Judge Robinson went through, is really kind of understanding what the racial, but I don't want to exclude it's certainly ethnic, religious, gender, sexual orientation uh, categories come along with it, and discriminatory practices of some of these policies, whether that can be through institutionalized approaches, uh, through laws, but even through court decisions, as she had mentioned. So Judge Robinson, you can go ahead and click on the next slide. Coalition building politics, which is just, again, I want to give another example beyond you know, just critical race theory, it explains social, political unification moments, but even divisions as well, and what the specific causes are in organized urban communities, but it can be in, in other areas as well. It's not unique to urban. We see a lot of examples of this even in rural and even suburban areas, but it's how you're trying to find pathways of either working or not working together. Uh, I oftentimes equate it to a lot of my students, uh, something like the, the Milk movie that came out years ago uh, when Harvey Milk was running um, for supervisor or councilman there in San Francisco. If you watched that uh, Sean Penn film years ago, you know, you see at least how it wasn't just a gay movement, but there was there were actually movements and interests in, in communities working together between small businesses, uh, certainly even um, senior citizens in San Francisco. And so you saw a, a lot of different groupings coming together to bring out concerns around discriminatory practices in San Francisco. So I wanted to offer a couple of quotes, uh, at least a couple of examples of what some, some authors have said on this. Um, the coalition po building politics is highly idealistic, which it is. It can be politically hardened and often is heterogeneously used for urban populations. And it sometimes is confronting power politics and social economic problems in specific communities. And that could be something like job opportunities, um, racial discriminatory practices, um, you know, there are a number, even police, which is largely being used, certainly in police reform efforts, uh, is largely when, when coalition building politics place, takes place. But if certain groups are not united, if we're not seeing certain communities working together first, before coalition politics is even taking place, then we can see some nice internal politics of each community kind of oftentimes eat away at itself to prevent actual um, or sustainable coalition politics from taking place. And so some populations can sometimes feel that they can be misled or even politicized. And so a person offers that in, in her book in 1993. But one thing I've studied a lot in coalition politics is when you're trying to find pragmatic approaches, when it's not just centered around elections, because too often coalition building politics is just centered around the voting booth, when really it extends beyond that. Um, it, it can be at rallies, it can be at movements, it can be through actual court cases, uh, because sometimes it's unusual that a lot of nonprofits and community organizations will work together to maybe file suits of discriminatory practices. Otherwise, it can be very lofty, it can be po very politicized, it can distract circumstances, and it can be very personal. 
um, in terms of how people will fill maybe a political vacuum, especially in urban uh, areas. So oftentimes we see a number of politicians politicize uh, what is considered racial or ethnic, uh, maybe occurrences or problems, as opposed to actual practical outcomes of addressing the bigger problem or issue in, in uh, communities. So I, I use a quote down there that racial politics is a struggle and not a promised land. In other words, it can't just be idealized. It's gotta be cemented with actual policies and ways of addressing a problem or concern before a community or communities. And so um, that quote was from Brown, Marshall and Tab. So if you're interested in this about coalition building politics, I would highly recommend uh, that author, uh, the authors, because they actually are coming out of San Francisco State University and they've done a lot of research on coalition building politics in urban communities. So go on ahead. Uh, so critical race theory in undergraduate and even upper level classes, in many ways it can help explain some of the social and political dynamics of what's taking place at a variety of different levels of government. And so I spent a lot of time for my own research as it relates to planning and zoning codes. Um, I was a city plan commissioner uh, on the board of a city plan in New Haven for, for a few years. And it's interesting to see and examine this uh, in a number of different laws um, and it's not so overt. In fact, it can be oftentimes disguised as invisible uh, racism or invisible segregation, or many of you are all probably familiar with it, de facto segregation in many urban areas and suburban areas. And I think it's no secret in Connecticut, we faced this for a long time. Westchester County has gone through a lot of lawsuits because of this, and certainly Long Island is notorious for this. Uh, one of the books I've assigned in the past has been Crabgrass Frontier. If you're interested in some of the redlining and blockbusting and some of the dynamics of institutional racism. And I don't want to exclude also, I'd want to include also ethnic because some of my students are surprised when they're reading a lot of the, uh, you know, laws and some of the rules that were decided and covenants that took place in subdivisions were including pathways of actually excluding whites. Uh, for a long time, there was a lot of discriminatory practices towards Jews and even Catholics. And a lot of my students are shocked because the assumption is that, oh, it's only white Americans where it's, no, no, that even internally you see this uh, within a lot of the practices of discriminatory practices. So if you want to read an interesting book, I would certainly recommend that. Also, Hayden, uh, I'm sorry, Dolores Hayden has written a book, great book on suburbia too. Um, so if you're interested in some of this uh, development practices, that's still in some ways a, even um, a concern in places, especially in the suburbs, you'll, you'll see this in, in a lot of the research, Kenneth Jackson's book and certainly Dolores Hayden. Um, so what I do on purpose, as, as Judge Robinson knows, I want to include not just the legal theories and practices and laws, but also include some of the political and historical elements that led to um, a lot of the, the problems that surround uh, racism and certainly prejudice and discriminatory practices uh, through other lenses. So students should already have an understanding of US political history, but oftentimes they don't. So sometimes it's lacking. So I go through a variety of different movements. Yes, the civil rights movement, but also the women's rights, gay rights movements, for example. And there are a number of different um, you know, lawsuits that kind of point to why there were a lot of discriminatory practices that took place, as Judge Robinson says, at the state and local level. So go on ahead. So I stress more of a thematic approach to understanding critical race theory and understanding it. Uh, as I said, you can examine it through social movements, which I tend to do. And I kind of go back even on purpose to the, the late um, late uh, 19th century because of what took place during Reconstruction, which is quite interesting, especially if you're familiar with Booker T. Washington and W.B. Du Bois uh, and the great race debate. That's that's quite, and actually it's interesting, a lot of my students aren't familiar with that, which is kind of frightening me, but it's, it's interesting because you see a lot of similarities in terms of finding ways of providing for social and political uplift. Um, and so I also uh, assigned a book called Uneven Roads, um, which explains kind of an introduction to US racial and political, US, um, excuse me, racial and ethnic, but also gender as well as sexual orientation, uh, you know, movement. So that can be very eye-opening for a lot of students when they see uh, discriminatory practices in a variety of states, including California. Um, and then I stress timeline factors and obviously landmark, landmark court cases that kind of found pathways of defining or not defining race and gender and sexual orientation. So that's always interesting to, to take apart. Um, you know, by a number of different students. And so we see this through different legal systems and political systems. Uh, certainly there are theoretical approaches in coalition building politics. And I examine a number of different things through studies and articles. And certainly I examine and use the final paper assessments and discussions surrounding identity politics through a number of different uh, class projects. So, and then I think the last one is, is this the final one, Judge Robinson? 
Or is that the last slide? Ah, yes, the concerns of surround critical race theory. So we should get a we spend a little time on this in terms of uh, what are the concerns? Well, sometimes too often, many people do not understand that it's very complex. It's very nuanced. And in an effort to really understand this, there's gotta be some basic understanding of what critical race theory is and how political history should not be overlooked. Too often CRT does become oversimplified for a lot of people because it is terribly complex. One of the things that I've, I've discovered certainly in teaching uh, you know, critical race theory in a couple of classes is that narrative voices sometimes are trying to fill a void or trying to address a problem. And a number of different ways can, can use this, poetry, uh, creative approaches, lyrics, fictional accounts. And a lot of these can be very controversial because it's not connecting to everyone. And so the number of different pathways of which to explain this. I have to admit, and Judge Robinson says this, or to me, we've discussed this over and over again, that sometimes a part of this is, it's very much based on um, literature uh, criticism. And I gotta confess, as I said to her, I'm not much of a lit crit fan. I don't use much of it, although a lot of my students find it interesting. I find it to be um, you know, very abstract and I don't always connect to it. So sometimes that gets lost in terms of another approach because it's not just legal. It can be, but it's oftentimes inclusive of narrative, narr uh, narratives as well as poetry and lyrics. And it can be very abstract for a lot of people. So I, I find it for a lot of my students, it can be unrelatable for some and it can be relatable to others. So sometimes you have to kind of explain and tease out a lot of that. And that's one of the reasons why I tend to do it more historical and political and explain critical race theory. And I think that's it. <laughs> so Judge Robinson, should we go back to those court cases you think? Is there time? I think that there is time, but I'm going to ask if there are questions in the queue that people want us to, um, to answer. Are there? Um, I'm deferring because I haven't looked at the queue. Judge Robinson, there is a question. Uh, it says Asians are superior financially and academically. Why is white the comparison standard? Why are Asians not the standard to aim for? Um, because that's not this. The studies have not borne that out. That is definitely a stereotype. And the stereotype is that um, Asian Americans are the model, um, the model minority. And so there's not robust work on um, the average net wealth of Asian families, but we have a lot of indicia that show us that the net wealth of Asian families is still lower than that of whites. For one thing, home ownership rates are lower. So the home ownership rates of Asian Americans are higher than black and uh, Latinx Americans, but lower than whites. But then if we take into account the income levels, because there are some studies that say on average, Asian Americans incomes are higher. Um, but if we take into account uh, the diversity in the Asian community, we're really talking about a subset of Asians. So there's actually the most economic diversity in the Asian racial group because there's so many different groups. And some of those Asian groups are actually performing at a lower level in terms of wealth and income than Blacks and Latinx. So it's, it's, it is not true. Um, I think that when you're talking about academics, you're talking about things like um, admission rates to college and higher education, but again, there are some reasons to understand that that is that they are not the best performing group. But I guess, Professor Wharton, here's where I'm kind of stymied. It, it, it almost is an irrelevant question because of what we're talking about. Like with critical race theory, we do not propose that any group is actually genetically or biologically superior to another group. We do look at how the laws are structured to allow certain groups to succeed at a higher rate. And so you could take that question and actually say, well, what is it about the laws and how they've been constructed that is allowing 
um, this group to perform secondary to white Americans. But what would your answer be? Yeah, and I would agree. And, and I would also add to it, this has been kind of complex alley right now as, as we're doing with admissions uh, <laughs> that, that Yale and Harvard is now faced with, right? Because this is coming up before the Supreme Court as it relates to front of action. So that, that would be something to add to it. And one thing I want to stress too, that you mentioned right at the beginning, Judge Robinson, and this is key, is that there is that model myth that sometimes is being perpetuated uh, culturally, politically, and economically. And so it, 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 sometimes you have to even kind of tease out, you know, specifics. You know, is it all Asians? Because the problem is, is that, you know, many people tend to lump South Asians in that group, which is, has its own factors. Um, you know, what about a little bit more, spe you know, specificity in, in the sense of, you know, nationality uh, of maybe, you know, Chinese or, or even, you know, something a little bit more specific like Korean or South Korean, for example. So it, it's, it's very difficult, but you're right, Judge Robinson. At the end of the day, it really rests more on the actual laws and how it's led to um, some of these practices. It really is discriminatory practices. And I do want to say, because we're lawyers, um, we like to say that the Asian American community is doing the best, but in the legal profession, they are struggling just like every other group that is non-white. And in fact, for the last several years, the attrition rate of Asian American lawyers has been um, the highest. So we, we've got to not fall into stereotyping and we've got to look at the policies that are um, scaffolding the structures that we have and why. But that was a great question. Um, any other questions? There is another question in the chat. Is the study, I'm sorry, in the Q&A, is the study of unconscious racial bias part of CRT? If not, why not? Um, implicit bias work did find a robust audience among critical race theory. So there are definitely legal scholars. Um, uh, um, Jerry Kang is the one that comes to mind who wrote the law review article, The Trojan Horse of Race, that was sort of a definitive first work on implicit and unconscious bias. So it really did grow out of it. It has now, kind of like Professor Warden said, become its own separate thing. And so there are definitely a lot of social scientists who are doing that work, but I think it would be considered under the tent of critical race theory. Um, here's another question. So I'll read the uh, statement first and then the question comes at the end. Um, I think you said that you discourage color blindness. Maybe discourage is not the precise word that you used but you seem to have a negative view of colorblindness. But if the police were colorblind, George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery would be alive today. Why not teach the police to be colorblind? Um, this is the, this is the um, implicit bias work that was just referenced in the other group. And that is because it's impossible. Um, because of the, the society that we live in, we cannot uh, be colorblind. Not now, and I don't think in our lifetime. And I'm not sure that I want us to be colorblind. What I do want is for us to not have negative associations with racial classifications. So I don't think the problem is that the police saw George Floyd as black. I think the problem is that the police saw a black man as dangerous. Two different concepts. And so I've never been an advocate of colorblindness because to me that means you don't see me. And, and my experience as a black woman is very much a part of who I am. But I don't want you to, um, I think we need to work at disrupting the implicit bias and there are ways to do that. Pro Professor Wharton. Yeah, there's no, I mean, there's no one way of, of addressing this, right? The part of the big problem when it comes to disparities is is that you know there's not a magic pill that really addresses the inequities, both political and economic, uh, in, in America. It's very difficult to achieve, and we've seen, or at least we try and find pathways of addressing that. But they're still problematic, right? Whether that's something like affirmative action, or whether that's something um, you know in, in terms of um, you know other approaches to address the bigger problem. There's not one way of solving it, and so. I, I get confronted by a lot of students on that. And, and uh, it's, it's a very, very complex issue. And the, I, again, because we're lawyers, I do want to trace the, the 
The doctrine of legal colorblindness really found its root in the dissent in Plessy versus Ferguson, where the, um, Justice Harlan said, you know, our constitution is colorblind. But I also point out to my law students that he said that um, in a statement in which he was asserting white supremacy. So the actual statement in the dissent is, we don't need to have um, a race in our constitution because white people are superior and they always will be. So we don't need that in the constitution. Let's be more noble about that. Um, so the notion of colorblindness was never designed in the legal doctrine to dismantle uh, racism. It was just, we don't need that legal tool to continue racism. And he ended up being right about that. Um, here's actually a request from um, an attendee. Um, if you could repeat the slide with ways to undo racial disparities, or at least just show it um, while we're- I don't think I had a slide. Was there a ways to undo racial disparities slide? I don't think there was one. Okay. Unless he's talking about your slides, Professor Wharton. I don't think, it might have, I, I can't remember. I don't think I had anything like that. Would it be tools? And well, that might be it. Maybe tools, I don't know. I'm not sure. We. I don't mind um, sharing this this slide deck if people want to contact me. Yeah, I don't think I did have one, <laughs> but that might be a hint that we need one. But then we'd say what Professor Wharton just said and that there's not just one <laughs> tool, there's not just one magic pill. Um, the next question is, um, can you speak more about CRT about how CRT defines racism and the CRT perspective on the idea that legal colorblindness will not resolve inequitable racial disparities, which I think you have, but if you wanted to speak more to that. I feel like I'm jumping in first on all of them. So I did you wanna take that one first? Oh no, go for it, go, go right Okay. Um, uh, critical race theory came about after the legal civil rights movement had um, accomplished uh, many of its goals. So in other words, Plessy versus Ferguson, which is separate but equal was abolished. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed. And so we had inoculated a lot of our laws of the explicit um, race-based uh, components and, and things weren't changing. The, the disparities weren't going away. And in fact, now if I, I had a different presentation, I would show you how things not only are not getting better in terms of racial disparities, in some ways they're actually getting worse. And we have race neutral, quote unquote, neutral laws. And so we know that what we're doing with this supposed colorblind approach isn't working. And so critical race theory comes up with a new way to try to work it. And Professor Warden is clear that this isn't the only way, that this is the way that they say um, we can remedy things. It tends to be more aligned with the way I think. And he said it, he tends to be more aligned with the coalition building approach. So the, whatever the approach, I think we have to address identity. And I, have to, I think we have to address it explicitly. And I hate to use this analogy and maybe I shouldn't. Whenever you say that, you probably shouldn't, right? <laughs> maybe I'll try it at first, but it's like, if there is a harm that has been done, in other words, if someone's hand has put, been put on the stove, taking the hand away from the stove is great, but it doesn't heal the hand. And so that's kind of the analogy I have to racism. The laws created racist results. We've tried to remove those um, laws, but we haven't ever addressed the harm. And there's no one way to really solve it. It's so, it's so complex and it's so historical. 
I'm really struck at how many of my students are surprised at not being familiar, for example, of a lot of the you know ethnic and, and racial practices, you know, or, or prejudices that, that really took place even at the state level. Um, and, and so sometimes when we go through uh, some, some of the laws and statutes in some of the states, I mean, even in New England, <laughs> Uh, you know, it's quite interesting when you go back to the laws of the 1700s, 1800s of discriminatory practices that, that took place. And so my, many of my students learn that from the beginning and they're surprised to discover that. So how do you address that from so long ago? And you saw the laws at least trying to be revised. You saw at least decisions being made, but yet there's still some of these practices that, that are there. And so for a lot of my students, the, the bigger issue is how do you address that? And so there's no one way of solving it, unfortunately. So true. The next question is, society has been teaching and promoting CRT of white supremacy for centuries. What strategies would you recommend to address in law schools? I'm not entirely sure I understand the question. So if you think you do, Professor Wharton, well, I think it's probably related more towards how it's being taught, I guess, in the classroom, I assume, for that question. Can, can we ask the questioner to explain? I'm not entirely sure what the question is asking. Yes, if you wrote that question, could you post it in the Q&A again? And then after you post, we'll be sure to get back to it. Okay. Um, while they're doing that, let me ask another one. Um, it appears that CRT is being used as a dog whistle to rally white supremacists in a supercharged movement to change education policies in order to cover up policies that keep others at a disadvantage. Is there a comparable historical period when this was happening with education policy? I'm not an expert on education policy, and so I'm not going to deign to answer that, but I will say the strategy of using critical race theory um, is not, for divisive purposes, is not new. And as Professor Wharton was talking about coalition building, I kind of felt like it's almost coalition building in the reverse. It's trying to bring together a disparate group of people to focus on a unified enemy um, but it's not coalition building. It's like the anti-coalition building. So when has that been done? Well, when has that not been done? It's been done, it was done with the Japanese internment. It was done with the deportation of Mexicans. It was done um, with the Trail of Tears. It was done um, during the segregation movement. Most recently, it's the immigration built the wall. I mean, that is a strategy that has been very successful um, for Americans uh, to divide based on race. And it's been largely politicized and misunderstood and misconstrued, unfortunately. Um, now, I oftentimes get a lot of back and forth from people on both sides about this. What I equate it to is, you know, as an educator at least, that students at least have an understanding of what it is and explaining it. Doesn't mean you have to agree with it. It just means you have to have an understanding of it. So I often I kind of equate it with taking like an economics class. You know, you can't just take Adam Smith or read Adam Smith, right? There are a lot of other economists out there. And so sometimes a lot of my students will just assume that, you know, you just have one or two theories and then that works when really it doesn't. It, there's a lot more, there are a lot more theories and approaches out there. And, and so often, so many people will politicize. I mean, look what's going on obviously when it comes to something like the, the misappropriation, uh, misunderstanding of something like communism. And so oftentimes that gets stressed over and over again, even in education. And so you saw that as Judge Robinson says, even during the civil rights movement, where it's assumed that if you, you were anti-American, if you were you know, a part of the civil rights movement and you were equated to being a communist. So it, it's interesting how that can be misconstrued and misused when really there's a lot more to it. It's very, very nuanced. Sure. Absolutely. So the question um, that I asked you all before, I have it here. Um, society has been teaching and promoting CRT of white supremacy for centuries. What strategies would you recommend to address in law schools? Mm 
I think the question is asking, if I'm not mistaken, that the race theory that has been taught for centuries has been that whites are superior. I, I think that might be it. I think that that might be the question, but maybe I'm wrong. He's saying yes. And, yes. And if, mm -hmm. and if that is the argument, um, that is why critical race theory was created because um, and this is this is way too long an explanation for this venue, but basically um, the idea is that the educational system has created the dynamic that we have now where people were taught for centuries that whites were superior. And so now we can't just say, okay, we're just gonna say everyone is equal and that'll do it. We have to create education and curriculum that do show that everyone is equal, but that also address that there was this history. I don't know if you'd agree with me, Professor Wharton, but I think one of the best antidotes is just to teach facts and history. I mean. Well, that's one of the reasons why before I even get into these theories, any of them, right? Before midterm, I specifically, you know, go through political history because many students and just, I think many people in general are not aware of a lot of these milestones or moments or, you know, a movements that have taken place or just shaping, you know, American society, but even many ways it's legal and political systems. And so that, that's why it's a necessity before I even, you know, one of the readers I use is critical race theory, which is very popular, it's cutting edge. And that's written by this edited book by Stefanik and, and Delgado. It's a very popular, wise used, you know, book especially for law schools and graduate schools. And so I assign that as my absolute last book because it's, it's a very intense book unless you have that understanding of actual American history in the first place. And we didn't get to talk about the citizenship cases, but the one of the, the interesting things that I teach um, is the naturalization law cases because in 1790, the Congress made um, a racial requirement to naturalization. So it said, if you were a free white person, you could naturalize, you could become a citizen in the United States. And over the next century, the courts weighed in on what it meant to be a white person. And what happened was there were all of these very intricate and established laws and court decisions, which um, gave the right to naturalization, the right to citizenship to white men and penalized white women if they married men who were not able to naturalize. So like marrying someone who was not white was akin to treason. There were white women who lost their citizenship because they married a man who was not white anti-miscegenation or who was not able to naturalize because they were not white. And so you have to understand if you grow up in a culture and over generations, you see the penalty for marrying someone not white is the loving penalty or losing your citizenship. Culturally, that begins to embed certain values and it, it creates a country that looks a certain way. And so just getting rid of those laws isn't going to wipe away the legacy of those cases. Thank you. Um, the next question is, how is CRT applied to fair housing and lending laws? Well, I've certainly studied a lot of that and, and teach a lot of it. Actually, I base a lot of my research and even class discussions on this because um, now, for a long time, certainly through federal agencies like the Homeowners uh, you know, uh, Loan Corporation, among others, um, they practice a lot of redlining uh, where they would identify communities that were heterogeneous and especially if they were uh, you know, inclusive of Blacks and in some instances even Jews uh, and then eventually Asians and Latinos and they would grade or at least offer a grade to it, an A, B, C, D grade. And that kind of goes back to what I said with Kenneth Jackson's book, Crabgrass Frontier. Uh, Dolores Hayden does the same thing as well. Um, and she teaches also at Yale University, I should have said that. 
and um, uh, Kenneth Jackson's a historian technically, but he's really into these intricate laws and he's at Columbia University. So they both kind of trace out how at least the federal government had partnered with uh, banks and, and mortgage companies to do these kinds of practices. Uh, it's kind of interesting because now you were seeing additional books are coming out uh, where it, it, you know, a lot of these practices are coming you know, to, to be re recognized now in the last uh, 10 years, especially. So a lot of these practices actually started out in the 1930s um, following um, you know, the Great Depression. A part of it was because home ownership rates were not a significant number prior to World War II. Uh, right now we're hovering at around, uh, it's, it's a little, it's about 60%, but back then it, it was nearly half that. So the idea of after the World War II is to find a pathway towards home ownership, uh, especially in suburban areas. And it's no secret after uh, you know, the VA bill passed after World War II, home ownership became a significant uh, tool and a means. But many people who are beneficiaries of it were white Americans and specifically you know, veterans. And so uh, we saw that in place along with HOLC and the practices and discriminatory practices that took place between the federal government and certainly banks. And so a lot of my students are kind of struck by that. The assumption is that discriminatory practices, especially as it relates to housing, uh, really took place more so in the South, but many of these practices were taking place in the North. And so that, that's quite interesting to many of my students. They're struck by that and why suburbs were created in the first place, uh, especially in Westchester and Long Island uh, counties. Uh, they're, they're really amazed by that with Kent Jackson's example of how banks and, and the federal government and eventually the state and local governments and even many subdivisions, uh, you know, practice these kind of discriminatory, uh, you know, lending and um, ultimately for people who live and reside there. And that accounts, wouldn't you say, largely for the wealth disparity that we have now, because um, when Blacks and uh, non-whites were able to buy the loans, they weren't necessarily government insured, which meant they had more egregious interest rates and there were higher foreclosure rates. And I mean, so these, these practices, even though they're not on the books right now, have ramifications that continue to reverberate. Absolutely, because home ownership is really the, the single largest <laughs> determinant of family wealth from one generation to the next. It, it tends to be the chief one. So thank you, Judge Robbins. Thanks for adding that. Yeah. I know we only have about five more minutes and I don't know, you know, how many more questions there are, but please. Um, yeah, there, are, there are a lot more, right? <laughs> okay. So two of our questions are actually the same. Okay. Um, how would you recommend slash suggest bringing up or having a conversation about the topic of CRT with people who do not really know what it is, but already have a negative bias about it? So I will do the plug. I'm working on a book on critical race theory for the, the lay person, you know, for the person who's not interested in studying it for an academic, but just wants to understand it. Um, but I, I mean, I definitely feel like convening programs like this is a good way. Um, there are book clubs you could do to discuss certain books, but I do think it's hard to self-study critical race theory. It is what I, I give kind of a shortened or abbreviated answer, and I probably oversimplified Judge Robinson, but what I tend to stress is that there are different lenses and different pathways of examining the laws and political systems. And so critical race theory is just an attempt to, to at least understand one of many. Uh, and it's not the exact answer, the precise answer, because there's so many different perspectives on it. So uh, as, as many people are outraged or concerned about it, I, I will respond back that really there's not one pathway of understanding the law. And we have to understand the historical nature of why laws came to be. And I tend to quote, you know, <laughs> James Madison and that, you know, if, if uh, you know, men were angels, we wouldn't need laws, but we really need to examine how the laws have been discriminatory in nature. Do you all have time for one more question? Sure. And I do want to acknowledge that somebody did write out there about uh, North Carolina, the, the legend, the, mo the movie that came out about the busing. And yes, I totally agree that that is a great example of coalition building theory. So thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> Um, can you give us some examples of previous laws specifically to enforce a racial hierarchy? You mean that, it, oh my gosh, there's so many. <laughs> the um, the, the anti-miscegenation laws, the um, naturalization laws, the 
uh, the, the rules and regulations around the home ownership loan corporation, which had explicit racial prohibitions, the um, Plessy versus Ferguson. I mean, they're just, they're, there's almost too many to name. I know I'm missing some more, so help me. Um, <laughs> the, the fact that um, we restricted, um, we, we put quotas, race-based quotas on immigration. Um, they're, just, they're just so many. They really are. It's so <laughs> held out of one. But that's why, uh, Judge Robinson, I hope you all can understand. That's why I prefer going more in the housing direction uh, and economic development, because that's kind of an interesting, there's so many different case studies and examples of that, no doubt about it. And uh, um, it, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, every, like if you look at any aspect of life, there were laws that had racial restrictions attached to them. Health, criminal justice, um, housing, education, you know, even being able to tra uh, travel, it, it, there are just so many. Very, very true, yeah. Is it time to wrap up, Dean? It's 6.15, uh, certainly get right on time. So I appreciate, I appreciate both of you. Um, and, and thank you um, for giving us your time and, and sharing your thoughts and um, comments around critical race theory. Uh, thank you to the participants for asking questions um, and engaging in this conversation. I encourage you to continue the conversation, ask questions for those uh, of those of the panelists and uh, those of us who are invested and engaged. I think we could all make a difference. Um, I do want to recognize, um, again, the Connecticut Bar Association and the Bar Foundation um, for holding this speaker series. Um, and let you know that our next Motley Speaker Series se session will be on May 10th, and we'll focus on voting rights. And please follow the CBA and the Bar Foundation communications for more information about this session. Um, please see the Q&A for more information about the verification codes, again, CRT 101 and theory. I thank you all and look forward to seeing you in May. Please enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Bye. Voting rights. I totally forgot that one. That's an obvious one. <laughs>